growing up, I didn't have field guides at all. There were no field guides for like any butterflies in the West. Uh, the closest thing we had was uh, Alexander B. Klotz published a, a Peterson field guide for the Eastern United States. Anybody know, don't cry for me, Argentina? Right? <laughs> I just, I did that because it seemed funny to me at the time, like I said, I've been cooped up. You know? <laughs> All right, now the deal is that um, as a result of, 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 of this uh, personal experience, I developed uh, an intuitive understanding of our butterflies, which as I have uh, been brought to learn over the last couple of years is insufficient to help all the rest of you. So, for example, uh, we were in Moses Meadows a couple of years back and, and there was a string of people that had, you know, containers with butterflies in them and I was standing at the head of that string and they were following me around and, and they were bringing in one at a time I would tell them what the butterflies were. And then they would ask like really annoying questions like, why? <laughs> so I would say something to the extent that, well, you know, because Pelham said so. Which was, in fact, true. But not adequate. Okay, so uh, tonight we are uh, beginning an adventure, um, and, and we're gonna, you know, uh, go on and, and help develop a, a new way of identifying butterflies in the field, sufficient to enable uh, people that are far less sophisticated than all of you to begin with, but certainly will enable all of you to identify butterflies. All right, so. Um, I wanted to, to uh, put a plug in for my favorite butterfly book, my first butterfly book. It was written by uh, Paul and Ann Ehrlich, and you guys know who Paul Ehrlich was, uh, is. And, um, and then it's important to recognize that this is uh, really a dry text. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, but I want you to recognize the bottom couplet on the page, okay? What does it say? Anybody tell me what it says? Not so. Not so. I'm telling you what, no one should ever put a couplet ending with not so, because then you have to go back and see all the stuff that's not so to find out what possibly could be, right? Um, nonetheless, that's, uh, that's the kind of thing I was dealing with, is this, you know, really dry um, stuff. So I ended up having to learn butterflies by peering at, like this is a part of a plate from Holland's Butterfly Book in 1931, which was really great. And this is an historic um, uh, uh, plate. I mean, a lot of the specimens that are figured there are actually types. And so they have uh, scientific meaning and are referred to like in my catalog over and over again. <coughs> but there's two problems. One is most of them don't occur in my particular region. And they also are, uh, you know, uh, using 1930s uh, terminology, so um, that didn't really help me out too much. And here's another example. These are wonderful things, and anyone who has a chance to look at, at 1931 edition of, of Holland's Butterfly Book certainly ought to. But you need to know that uh, it wasn't until 1975 that we actually had a butterfly book that dealt with um, butterflies in our region. And by that time, I had already become intuitively acute. Not cute, <laughs> but a, a cute, which has no bearing. Right. All right, so I, that was the limitation. And this is another example from how to know the butterfly. <coughs> that was a picture of a butterfly. Now, fortunately for me, um, you know, I lived in a place where that particular butterfly was common enough that when I actually got one, I could look at that image and say, yeah, baby, that's it, all right. But that's not really good. Then, as a part of the revolution that's taken place over the last three years, people like David Droppers uh, and Caitlin Lamar, who's not uh, here tonight, but she gave me permission to use her artwork, um, Caitlin put together a, a key to fertilizers. Fertilizers. And fertilizers are tough, period. They're just kind of hard for especially beginning people. They're, um, I think she's shown by her key they're not as tough as all that, but I think what she also showed was that, you know, if you put it together, this isn't exactly a key, it's a kind of a table key or a combination of those things. It showed that there's a lot of promise, and, and so like this is up a little closer so you can actually see like the categories and how she goes about, um, you, know, you know, delineating them. I, I really see a lot of promise for that. Of course, she's just doing this for like Okanagan County. Um, you know, to go on a larger scale would require a little more expertise, but that's something that, you know, is a, it's an accretionary event. 
Do you like that accretionary? It's a snowball cut, you know, mm -hmm. the other's moss. Is that how that works? Yeah. It is uh, part of a book or part of a specific yeah, page? Yeah, it, it's part of a page. I, I, I took it out of, a, of, of this. I sliced, sliced it oh, up. So, we, so that's the whole thing? Mm -hmm. No, this, this is the whole thing. That's the whole thing. So right. it's published like that. And I just, yeah, I cut it out so you can see it, so people can see it better on screen. That's page 185 of a whole book. Right. Yeah. What's the book? She has a pamphlet. Yeah, well, this, it's actually in, in preparation. Uh, I, I'm reviewing it um, right now. I've been reviewing, like, Bob's book, and, and you know, I, I you know, had the time, so to speak. She has a pamphlet. Right? Well, she put out a guide that's available in uh, PDF or something like right, that. Right, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, this is, no, this is, like, if it's, I don't know how she's going to get it printed out. It's going to be about 120 pages, right? Wow. And it's going to be, it's going to be pretty nice. I like it a lot. <laughs> She got really good images too. Um, anyway, so what I wanted to do is talk about some of the things that y'all need to have as part of your toolkit before you go out into the woods. Now, everybody here knows what dorsal and ventral means. I assume that your uh, silence. Right. Yes. I mean, yeah, I don't think it is. Right. Um, this is like sort of a, a, a tour. I wanted to, to look at, okay, the butterfly wing has. Only one part uh, structure that you need to know, and that's the discal cell. The discal cell is a major part of uh, the structural, uh, uh, and it's, it's basically a, a major uh, support for the wing in flight. And, and you can see all the cells and veins that you know extend from it. I would not ask most people uh, initially to learn that, but it's important to know the discal area. And you will see that term used a lot because uh, it reflects a place on the wing that if you're going to talk about how a butterfly is different from another one, you will refer in the discal area or the discal spot or blah -de blah discal this, right? And then there's, you know, caudal and cephalic. Um, I don't use that too much. Um, there's usually another way to say it and it's not really pertinent to the overall uh, wing pattern, which is what most of the, uh, the keys, most of the guides that your most field marks that you're going to see uh, have to do with um, with the actual patterns on the wing, not so much front and back. But these terms, okay, apical. Okay, can anybody name a butterfly that is significant in terms of an apical marking, and it lives in Seattle, so that really cuts things down, right? Yeah. Absolutely, you win the prize, which is absolutely nothing. But <laughs> Gorkman's Admiral is is a you know it has an apical orange streak, and that's really important because it gives you something that you know if you have the question, it's like okay, apical Gorkman's Admiral. I know, I know what apical means, and it's, it's it is kind of important because the wing basically four wing is, is essentially triangular, as you can see. You have a costal margin, you have an apex, an outer margin, and an inner margin, and these are all, you know, going to be used at some level or another to describe things in the wing. I will kind of get to that in a minute. Uh, I just wanted to get through these uh, the basic, uh, you know, characteristics so that you know, when I do some uh, some looking, I can actually ask you if you can figure out what it is that we're talking about. All right, so let's go and look. Okay, so here's a butterfly that doesn't occur in Washington. Yeah. What is the caudal? Caudal is the, okay, good. Put the tail. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, caudal is the back end. Cephalic is, you know, cephaly, hydrocephaly, you know, all that pertains to the head. Caudal is tail, right? And so, so we're like, talking about the body? The back end, no, no, at the, at the very back. If you say caudal, you're saying think you're going that way. If you say cephalic, you're going that way. So it's not actually a region, it's the direction. Okay. It's like with so, the, I'm sorry. Joe. Yeah, go ahead. It's like with the fish, the tail is often just called the caudal fin. Yeah. Caudal fin, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, well, at least I figure out. Okay, this is not a butterfly that occurs uh, in our area, but it's a butterfly that shows some features. Okay, like if you look at that hind wing, what is one thing that just stands out? It's like really obvious, right? Like the orange. It's that band. Okay, now so that band is situated about where on that wing? Medium, right? So this is a 
median band. And the one that's just to the outside of it, the gray one, that is a post-median band. Now, butterflies are like English, you know, in some ways. That doesn't always make sense because if there's a median band and there's a post-median band, then the band that is to the base there, that should be a pre-median band or sub-median. Sub it is sub-median, you're right. Okay. So it's supposed to be sub-median or pre you got it right. Right. So what's what's that little band along the edge there? What's that? Marginal band, right? So you guys already have this down. We don't have a problem here. All right. Now, now we get to a group that we're not going to talk about tonight at all because they're checker spots, and well, we'll talk about them at the very, very end of the presentation. And the reason it's going to be at the end is because it's very sensual. And it's prurient, actually. And it requires a certain element of prurience to understand Czechoslovakia because you have to dissect their genitalia. Right? And the kinds of things that motivate you to dissect genitalia are, by nature, prurient. Right? <laughs> right. And by definition. Here, you got this great, I mean, you got all the bands that you'd want to talk about. We got, what band is that? What's the band inside of that yellow spot? So, so marginal? Oh, I'm not sure. you're, well, you're good. Maybe you can be up here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, what's this red one? Post-median. Post Come on. So, what's the, the yellow one there? Median. A median band. So, if I sit there and I'm you know in a situation and I actually feel foolish enough to try to describe how to discriminate checker spots, which I will I will do in the next slide, actually, um, I would say that. Well, the post-median band is, is pale cream, um, and, or no, post-median band is, is ruby red, and median band is cream, the marginal spots are, are red. Okay, so like, the idea that these things are spots or bands, that's all depending on how they look on the butterfly. Um, this is obviously, you know, actually a band with red spots in the middle, whereas this is actually more of a band, but you know what? We're not going to bandy words about <laughs> I expected a bigger laugh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so you guys got a deal. This is a question that I get on field trips all the time: is the Edith alarm. And part of the problem is um, on field trips that I've been on, we hardly are ever in places where the Edith checker spot is flying. We're always where there's a Nissi or, or a colon flying, and very rarely where um, Edith. Checker spots are flying. Well, that's a couple of reasons. One is most of the places where uh, the Taylor's checker spot are flying are, uh, you know, they're pretty protected areas that they, they wouldn't really want a bunch of people with nets out flying, you know, uh, walking around. And or they're at high elevations. And, you know, we've been to places like Lion Rock where they would occur, or they're out in the deserts, and, you know, there's a, only a few places uh, where they fly. So this isn't the best image. It was the best I could find, though of the Edith line. Now, you see this line here, which is the <laughs> post medial band. Y'all are bad. <laughs> All right, it's got, you see that little black line that's in the middle of it there? Can you see that? I mean, I didn't know for sure if the graphics would show that, you know. And I'm a little oblique to it myself, so I'm not sure how, you know, rich an image it is from out there. But that black line is entirely contained within the red uh, band. And it, that doesn't always work, but it's like one of the few things that works most of the time with checker spots, okay? So that's what the eat of the line really is. And that's pretty much the last time I'm going to uh, say about checker spots. Um, okay, colors. Now this is this this is where you guys, you, you got to help me out here, all right? Because this is tough. This is really, really, really tough. Somebody tell me what color that is. <laughs> Tell me what color that is. It's tawny. Oh, it's not tawny. It's no, kind of unsilver. It's uh, what? Unsilver. Well, no, 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 don't look at the spot. Look at the Okay, look. It's beige. This here, in, in, in fritil areas, we almost always talk about the ventral hindwing disc. And the reason we call it a disc is because there is a discal cell 
that dominates. That's the distal cell right here. So this area right to the base of that post median band of spots is called, this basal area is called the disc. And that is a ventral hindwing disc. And ventral hindwing disc colors are really important in, in fertile areas. And, and in this fertile area, um, this is a great basin fertile area, Spiria glass. And, and that disc color is like, it's got awful, man. It's sort of brown, maybe with some, like almost a little greenish overtones. And, and I don't know. It, it, what's worse is this is a, a species, this is the same species right here. Yeah. And tell me what color that is. Well, you, obviously it's got some green in it, right? But would you call that green? No, it's not green. It's kind of a buff, greenish buff tan, maybe, beige? You guys aren't helping me. <laughs> what, what kind of a color is that? Cappuccino frog. Honey. <laughs> That's not... Yeah, I'm going to write that down and say, okay, it goes, it goes in the key, cappuccino frog, right there. Well, and this is one that we see all the time, now, this one and this one. Now these are coronas for malaria, and we see them all the time on, on field trips. Uh, it's one of the, the butterflies that David James is going to be uh, tagging uh, because they're an amazing butterfly. They, uh, they emerge in the spring out in the desert, and, and they go up into the hills and the mountains all summer long. And then they return and lay their eggs in the desert. And this has a wonderful uh, advantage of avoiding laying your eggs out in the desert and having to put up with you know, incredible high temperatures all year long. And, uh, and, and so like this is a really you know, advanced strategy for this butterfly. And they're in, sometimes in the un, untold hundreds of thousands. There's places when they're just, well, in eastern Washington in the spring, you know what purple sage is? It's a mint, a bushy mint plant. If it happens to be blooming when these things are emerging, you can see like three or four hundred of these butterflies just plastic them a minute before they take off. So it's a butterfly that you know everyone you know gets familiar with, but it's not one that if I'm sitting there with one on my hand and I tell somebody and they want to know why it's that, I say, well, because it has this uh, uh, buff green tan beige this color. <laughs> is that about right? That's, yeah. Right. Well, and then what's that? I mean, I, you know. It's important that we come to some consensus because I don't want to be left with saying something silly like buff tan green or you know ochre ochre greenish. You know, I, I, these are hard questions, and, and we're going to see some more. Uh, it's it's the reason it's hard is because there's um, in nature is so variable. First of all, and you know if you're going to impart um, information to someone else. It's useful that we're all using the same, you know, vocabulary. I mean, words are only as good as the definitions we give them, right? So if we're going to make a field guide or a, a, a key or any kind of uh, guide to identification, you know, uh, what we use as words to describe the uh, organisms we're trying to identify are especially pertinent. And if, if I say buff, tan, greenish, and, you know, like, even if that's accurate, it doesn't necessarily portray to anyone else uh, what exactly I'm talking about. And here's another one. Um, I actually like this one because uh, it has a uh, quality that's a northwestern butterfly, first of all. Um, it, can anyone see the purple tone in that butterfly? There is actually a tone underneath. And I talked with a number of people about um, how, do you, how do you describe something that's kind of like their but it's not there. You know, you can't point your finger at the color, but it's kind of like in the background. And uh, one fellow, uh, I know he used the word inclusion, and Nunley said, eh, inclusion sounds more like, you know, like a mineral term. You know, you have a vein or something that's, you know, penetrating. Um, this is actually more of a subtle uh, underneath uh, appearance. It actually is, is more profound in nature than it is in a mounted specimen, because in nature, all the colors are more vivid. In nature, you know, you see a thing that is alive, and so the, the, the vibrance of all those colors and, and the, the subtlety of, of, a, of a purplish color in a, a mounted museum specimen is you know, much more striking and, and profound in something that you're going to see in nature. And this is a butterfly. This is the uh, Northwest, or no, it's Hadaspe. What's that? Uh, Hadaspe. Well, the Hadaspe fertilary. 
Well, that's terrible. And they could come up with something better. All right, so now we're going to talk about some, some fritillaries that uh, are, are confused. They have you know, some color issues and they have some pattern issues. Uh, this is the Calippi fritillary. And I'm going to try to go back and forth between these two images. This is the Coronas fritillary. And these are two fritillaries that we're liable to see in the same places over on the East Slope at the same times. Now, people will confuse the two a lot. And there's really, um, it's sort of understandable. Uh, the, the green aspect of, of coronas that kind of you know goes along with the green aspect of calippi although calippi is really a, a green butterfly right but there's something else there that's going on what do you guys what do you guys see uh, in calippi you know, coronas spots are huh the silver spots are much uh, different pattern that, the silver spots are kind of long right right and that's exactly right and they're stretched okay and there's, there's something else. Uh, there's a ground color difference, which is hard to see. The top one um, on the upper side of, in the corner, this is one of uh, Katie's images. Um, and, 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 and that's really a, a pretty typical um, uh, specimen. That's like what you like to see. It's, it's a paler, um, uh, kind of a yellowish uh, orange, whereas uh, Coronas is kind of a tawny um, color. But also, you see how the spots from the underside show through. And, and that's very, very typical. That's also hard to describe. Um, I've kind of worked around that, and I you know, end up pairing what ended up being half a paragraph into about three sentences. Yeah? Well, but it seems to me a lot of the time, I mean, I've been looking for that with for lyrics for quite a while. It uh -huh. seems to me that a lot of the time, later in the lives of almost all the fritillaries, the spots kind of start coming through on them. Right, no, that's, yeah, that's yeah. because of where. Right. right, right, right. No, that's, see, that's another problem. We're going to get to that, too. Okay. One of the things that a, a good field guide does, actually, and that's why um, I have in, in our collections at the, U, at the UW, I have a number of, of specimens that, you know, people ask me, why did you collect that? I said, because we need to know what things look like when they're all beat up. And if you don't, then you are not going to be able to identify the beat up specimens that you see, you know, especially with fritillaries. See, there's no magic bullet with fritillaries. You don't get to dissect their genitalia. They all look the same. Yeah, I will return to that topic. Repeatedly. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. We'll, we'll see later how fascinating it really is. Anyway, um, so another color uh, issue, um, and this is something that um, I think this is resolved here tonight. What color would you say these sulfurs are? Green. Ah, who, who said green? Somebody said green. That's exactly right. Did you say green? Green. I said green. Well, you just. <laughs> He's supposed to know, man. He specializes in, in spectroscopic analysis. But that's what, this is a greenish sulfur, which is another name I don't like. I guess it, Labrador sulfur is another name. Uh, Coleus nastis is its scientific name, and anyone who's ever tried to actually, you know, catch one has another name for them. The nasty sulfur. They, they fly this far up the ground, and they always fly uphill. I don't know where the butterflies go. Uh, if they all get to the top and they disappear or what, but you never see one flying downhill. Serious. Okay, so, um, so here, you know, we're going to go through a, a series of, of um, of, of images that are going to, you know, kind of, you know, beg the question: What color is that? Yellow. Well, come on now, you don't see the orange. orange. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So where is the orange? Is it? It's kind of at the outer part and along the veins. Look, you look at that specimen over there. The the veins are kind of lined in orange. Well, um, uh, we did the UV reflectance on that particular specimen, and in ultraviolet. That orange color that's along the veins is reflected, and the yellow uh, is not. So you have this dark gray butterfly with this uh, scintillant uh, in UV uh, reflectance. So um, it, it's probably actually important if, in fact, you know, mate selection uh, yeah. is important. You know, uh, but we don't. We know that it's not in some cases, and we know that it is in others. But you know, trying to describe sulfurs are a booger. You're not going to hear too much more about them either. I mean, they're just—I'm going to do it all right here and get them out of the way. But 
Okay, so here, now there's no question about these, right? That's, that's definitely orange, right? And the one next to it, yeah, it's orange, but it's not as intense, right? So we, we run into a problem of describing, okay, this butterfly is dorsally orange. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah, this butterfly is sort of dorsally orange, and, or the orange is restricted to the veins, or it's a, a lighter orange, or it's an orange superimposed on yellow. I mean, you can see the kinds of problems we run into. Now, if every, oops, if every, butter, if every butterfly, if we had a species in the state, or two species in the state, and one was like that, and one was like that, and they didn't have any other coleus, we'd, we'd understand coleus perfectly. That's profoundly different. We don't have a problem, right? Unfortunately, uh, all those other ones I showed you, some of them are, are one of these two species. So, they, I mean, maybe they do some hybridization, or in the case of the, uh, the alfalfa sulfur, is that the common name, or what is it? Orange. Orange? That's uninspired. <laughs> Orange sulfur? Yeah, I used to call it alfalfa butterfly. I think alfalfa butterfly is much more whatever. <laughs> Orange sulfur? That took a lot of brain work. So, don't they, uh, you know, as, as the butterfly gets older, uh, it fades in color anyway. Right, well that's another problem that you have to address too. But this particular butterfly is seasonally um, uh, variable, so that uh, early spring forms have much less orange, it's you know, um, concentrated just in the discal region of, of the foreign hindwings. So that, that factor um, into, you know, what, if you see one of those, in fact, Caitlin, um, about four years ago, um, had a bunch of pictures her dad took, because they hadn't been growing alfalfa in the valley, they'd never had alfalfa at the house. So when her dad took these pictures um, and sent them back to um, Caitlin, she said, what are these? And I said, well, they're, they're coleus erythemy, the, the orange sulfur. She so said, well, they're not very orange. And I said, well, you know, and they don't, they're not very big and they have, you know, they don't look like, I said, yeah, that's a problem. So we have to identify, and we'll get to some of that too, we have to identify the seasonal morphs. This is a, a, a sample of uh, butterflies that Andy Warren took from a single place on a single day. So if I was going to try to write um, a field guide uh, account or um, even write, you know, like try to describe this variation in such a way that anyone catching any one of these different things independently from having, I mean, you know, we have a, a, a big sample here so we know that this butterfly goes from orange to yellow in one place. And, and so we understand something that a person encountering just one or another of these mm -hmm. wouldn't have a clue. But you have to describe them so that, yeah. Has anyone just made a color key for this? Well, you mean use it? I'd like to like have color, say whether you can give a color to that name you show. Well, there's, a, there's two problems with that. Yeah, and, uh, actually, yes. Um, there is actually a, a handheld device that people use to um, analyze colors in the field. But the best uh, device that we have available to us, for the most part, are the non-handheld devices above our nose. And we are able to you know, evaluate these things in a qualitative way. And we have to rely on that qualitative um, uh, way and to such an extent that it becomes intuitive, okay? Intuition can't be discarded here. Uh, scientifically, there's three problems I've run into with people that are doing this work. One is that the devices you use to measure um, those things, you can measure um, angstrom units, I think. Um, you, you know, you can measure color in a lot of different ways, right? But uh, the, the, the people that um, are evaluating these oftentimes have monitors that you know, portray the colors differently. Then all of a sudden, you, you know, there's all these variables that get um, you kind of uh, you know, thwart, that thwart the effort to identify. So I think. We kind of you know do a qualitative thing instead of a, a quantitative yeah. what thing. I'm thinking of is just as important as getting the exact color. Though, is just the name, so you have a color with a name associated with it. That way, you, you, you can make it in you essence. Well, I can do that right now. Yeah. See that one over there? That one right? right there, that's spanky orange. Right. That's fine. So you call it spanky <laughs> orange. Then you would have that color somewhere. Right. You wouldn't have the butterfly be that color like in a circle. Mm -hmm. This is spanky orange. This is Pelham Blue. This is this. This is this. Don't use my name in vain. I'm sorry. His name is Can we call down, you know? It's the praise your name, though. All right. Well, actually, hey, I got nothing better than that. That sounds all right. We'll just uh, add that to the list of things that we might. You know, we're going to look at some things here. 
that um, you know everybody has no problem. I wish I'd stop doing that. Whatever it was, I just did. All right. Now this is, you know, the two species represented by this image, and these two species are actually pretty easy to discern. You can tell uh, what what the main differentiating feature is. Is one of them has these big orange spots on the marginal spot. Real good, good. And the other one does not. And the the one on the left is our uh, western tiger swallowtail. The one on the right is the Canadian tiger swallowtail. And uh, that's that works well. It's like almost 100%, and, and if it's not 100%, and they've been doing the uh, Humpty Bump. Again, this is the other one. This is uh, you know the Zelican swallowtail versus the Old World swallowtail. And um, up on the on the right side is the Old World. On, on I mean, no, on the left side is the Old World. On the right side is the Zelican. Uh, the classic uh, uh, character is the the um, the spot at the I should, I should, you know, at the anal angle, we'll call that. But anal angle sounds almost Herbie. scandalous. All right. At any rate, you can see that you know Zelican has a pupa that's basically disconnected, sitting within the orange spot. Um, very, very characteristic. Uh, the old world swallowtail um, oftentimes doesn't have a pupa. I mean, a pupil at all. It has. Uh, the extension along um, the, the, the outer margin, you know, it goes into the inner, but it, sometimes it can be swollen and club-like, but it's never in the middle of, of the eye spot. And then on the uh, ventral uh, forewing, you have in the old world swallowtail, a um, very, very uh, obvious and, and visible dusting of yellow spots, which is never present uh, in, in the uh, zelican swallowtail. So like this is a butterfly, <laughs> And this, I mean, I've never been misled. There's a, another character that I couldn't get a good feature of. It's a, a Zelican abdomens are essentially black with a yellow stripe, whereas the old world swallowtails have a big uh, yellow uh, patch on the, the whole side of the abdomen's yellow. But so like, you're not going to make a mistake um, with these butterflies. That's why I said they're, they're pretty easy. This is also one that people make mistakes with, but um, they, they're, you know, they really should. And this are Becker's on the left. And uh, is it spring white? Okay. Um, I'm, su I'm surprised somebody didn't mess that up. But um, the main difference, besides the obvious one, is that one's green and the other is kind of a, a yellowish brown, um, you know, markings on the ventral high wing. Did you see that clear spot there? I don't want to go too far, I'm going to fall down or something. That, um, <laughs> Just beyond the distal cell on the ventral hind wing of the Beccari eye is a clear area where all the vein, the veins are essentially clear. There's, there's no scaling along them, whereas in the uh, spring white, there's scaling along all of them, all right? Uh, there, people will talk about, you know, this so-called arrowheads that, you know, point back. And I think that's also a, a reasonable characteristic. I just never cited it. It might be one of those things that someone, you know, looking at uh, a key that we prepare or a, a field mark, um, a list of field marks that we prepare would say, well, why don't you mention that? And then, you know, I will ask them to actually put it in words. But, I mean, this, this butter, these butterflies are, are really not going to be mistaken for each other, okay? And this is another one that came up. Melanie brought this to my attention um, last year, and I, you know, all the the, the, the normal uh, features by which these butterflies are pulled apart is the Clodius Parnassian on the left, and the, uh, the Smithius or what Rocky Mountain? Smithius. Smithius Parnassian on, on the right. Or mountain. Mountain weather. And and there's one really um, you know clear character that actually stands out. Uh, uh, as well as any of them. Uh, everyone you know, cites the antennal character, which we'll look at in a second, but if you look at the, uh, the four-wing uh, discal cell, okay, y'all remember where the discal cell is, right? And you see those, those bars, okay? And if you look at the clodius, the, the bars are pretty much the same intensity as all the rest of the dark markings on the four-wing. And whereas in, in the Smithius and the, and the Mount Parnassian, those markings are much darker, much darker, much more intense. And, and that's very consistent. And, and, and once you recognize that, once you see it, it's like you know instantaneous recognition. Now, in the females, there's another characteristic that um, is um, useful, but it's not always present. Okay, um, Clodius uh, females or males uh, never have any red on the forming at all, whereas uh, Rocky Mountain 
or the mountain or the smith is, um, for instance, very frequently do. And, and so like that's, if you ever see uh, a, a Parnassian with red on the floor wing, then you know that it's uh, the, the mountain. Of course, and this is the standard uh, feature by which they're, uh, they're differentiated. It's also absolute. Uh, Clodius has a solid black antenna, and uh, the uh, you know, Smithius has that uh, every, uh, it has annual rings of white, which make it look checkered. Uh, again, it's absolute. That's, that works except when you go to the Yukon, right? And we don't live in the Yukon. Um, this is another way to tell females apart. Now, if you can see that um, that waxy white-looking thing that's drooping down from the female abdomen there, well, you knew I was going to get to sex again, but that is a chastity belt that the male uh, and puts on the female at mating. It's so. Uh, one of the few things that useless bags of sperm actually get to do. Um, and it's really something to see because it comes out as a frothy substance. It's really amazing. It doesn't look like it would have a form in the shape that's characteristic, but when they get done and it hardens, um, it, it is actually extremely characteristic, not only um, in, in just our state, but across the globe. There's nothing else in the world that looks like that. Now, one of the first trips to the Waba that I went on with the Waba um, uh, field trip was to Rocky Prairie in the Tonino area, <clears throat> and we encountered a virgin Clodius um, uh, that had, was an abnormal emergence. It just, you know, was, it was, it was like in July. They normally would have been gone, and of course, there were no other males around, but the, you knew it was virgin because it didn't have one of those things. But anytime you see that, then you'll know that you're dealing with the Clodius, and it's not hard to see either. Now, this is um, the Concordant, the, the, the Smithius. Now, you can hardly see it, but what you can see of it is it's dark brown, okay? It's like a very compact and dark brown thing, and it's very, very uh, characteristic. When we go on a field trip, I'll make a point um, the next time that I'm there uh, to point it out because it's kind of interesting. Um, it's also interesting that this, these butterflies and a few other butterflies that are also protected, by the way, Parnassian butterflies are protected, they're toxic. So don't eat them, all right? <laughs> just a word of the wise, I'm telling you. That they're going glycosides and some other nasty things you just don't want to be a part of. Um, and you can tell that, actually, if you're out flying in flight. If you're out walking around the, in the field and you see a Parnassian, how, how do Parnassians fly? Like, not a care in the world. They're just kind of cruising along this like. Well, if you taste as bad as they do, you can afford to be that way. I mean, and you're white with black markings and orange spots. It's like, yeah, that's called aposemesis. It's like, I taste nasty. You know, like, you don't want to eat me. Well, there's other butterflies that also have asparagus and are toxic. And it's really interesting that uh, they have, you know, very similar flight patterns and behaviors are totally unrelated. So there's this convergence. I don't know what the Spragus has to do with it. Uh, Spragus is the, the uh, I didn't tell you that, did I? Spragus is what they call that chastity belt. I'm sorry, every once in a while you know, I get ahead of myself. Right. Spragus, can every, everyone say Spragus? Spragus. And I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you what that means in the Greek. Um, another one, it's really easy to tell, um, the one blue in uh, all of North America that is completely absent any markings in the submarginal region of, of a, a ventral hindwing, okay? There's no markings there. You've got the, uh, the post-median row of spots, and they can be various. They can be dark, they can be ringed with white and all that, but there's no other markings external, all right? So, that's, you can nail that one all the time. And it's sister in the same genus. Glaucosyche uses the silvery blue uh, Glaucosyche lignumus. His sister is the arrowhead blue Glaucosyche uh, piasis. And it's as different as it could be from um, its sister species. But it's also like extremely easy to identify. I mean, that's a butterfly that, you know, like uh, you know, in, in the key or in the field guard, guy could just put a picture and you say, this is an arrowhead blue. And if you need any more than this, go study beetles. <laughs> the other line is not so. Huh? The other part of the couplet is not so. Not so. 
not so good, are you? Right? I like not so. That's terrible. How would they do that? All right. And this is, a, you know, a couple of coppers. Um, you guys know which coppers these are? Our guy got Edith's copper. Edith was real popular. She got a check spot named after her and a copper named after her. I think it was, uh, might have been you know, William Henry Edwards' daughter. And um, there was a fellow okay. named Mead that married her. And he named, uh, he didn't name Edith's. I don't know how the check spot got named that, but he named that, that copper. And then yeah, this one, you know what that one is? Mariposa. Yes. right. Now, I'd be willing. And this is another one. You, you don't have to do much. If you had to describe the Edith's copper ventral hind wing pattern, you say all spots inflated and with color on the inside, right? Because the spot is inflated and it's got color inside of it, right? Um, but this one, you know, all you have to, to say is uh, ventral hind wing ashy gray, and all spots with a shadow, right? I mean, that's because it kind of looks. I, these aren't my own words, you know, I borrow them. And, and then, and then the, I mean, you guys know which, this is the, you know, Heloides, that's the purplish copper, and then that's the vowel, so we're there, the, um, uh, the what? Lavender border? Lilac. Oh, lilac border, right. Good. That's much better. But it's easy to tell. I mean, if you have a problem identifying that butterfly, then, you know, it's like short square one. You can go back to a cabbage wax. Yeah, you do that. But, so these are butterflies that we can identify pretty easily. Um, we can make field guide, our, our field marks and, and, and enter our field guide, um, or our field guide entries will be uh, fairly simplistic, consisting mostly of a photograph, right? Except for the females. Huh? Except for the females. You kind of control, don't you? Yeah, no, except for the females. Although, actually, the females are the same. In most cases, we're looking at the ventral surfaces, right? If you look in the upper surface, yeah, it's a home ball. And you know, like, what we'll deal with those things. Okay, so, like, these aren't as easy, but they can all be done. And the reason why they're not as easy is because they actually represent situations like the coleus we looked at, the sulfurs, where in a given population, you can have a number of things that look rather different. Well, these are just dimorphic forms of the same butterfly. These are our, our, actually from the same place. And this is just a, a dimorphic female, the margin of white. Um, so we're going to have to, when we're describing this butterfly, include that alternative. You know, that the angular females that are, you know, flat or, or yellow uh, uh, tone. And, and then, um, and this is uh, a case of seasonal polyphenous polymorphism. Uh, the, the one on the left is a spring morph, and the one on the right is a summer morph. And I mean, you know, like if you're in western Washington and you live like over by Belfair, and you see a margin of whites, well, the ones in April, May uh, are going to be like the one on the left, and the ones in July and August are going to be ones. I mean, you, you, you know, if you didn't know any better, you, you'd think they're like different species, right? You have to be able to identify, um, you know, that the, the, these butterflies have these seasonal variations. And you have to be able to delineate them such that people uh, will understand what it is that they're seeing. Now this is hard. This is uh, western white on the, on the left and a checkered white on the right. Now we barely get checkered whites, although we probably get them more often than we think because everyone that sees um, the western whites, you know, they're, they're going, uh, probably every tenth check, uh, western white is a checkered. And it's just like they're usually going by on the road so fast that, that you know you don't you know get a chance. But fortunately there's a, a character, you can almost see it if you look up at the apical region of the forewing. Right where these veins come off the end of the discal cell, which you can kind of see in the in the western light. Um, yeah, right up there, the, the veins uh, split. They do so in a different order, um, slightly um, different. It, it, it's hard, it's hard to, to see, in a, certainly on an image, and it's a little hard to feel unless you know what you're looking for. But it's pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good indicator. So like, that would be something obviously we would include in the, in the key. Now, y'all know what these are, right? Marbles. Yeah, you 
Chloe Plata, which is the desert marble on the left, and the Chloe Asanides, which is the large marble on the right. And this is actually fairly subtle, but actually fairly profound, what you need to know. Um, the, the size difference here, um, I, I, put this, I chose these two slides so that you can see how wickedly different the hind wing is. Now, the, the hind wing is actually mounted slightly behind, but even if you rotated it up, you'd see it's much longer, more elongated, and um, really a, an entirely different shape. That's hard to describe. Different shapes of wings are hard to describe, and yet in many cases when we're looking at, um, at, at certain uh, butterflies, you know, the shape actually is uh, important, and it's um, a challenge. Well, it, it's a challenge to describe. Uh, sometimes it's a challenge to even measure. But the number one criteria for measuring these two butterflies are these spots at, at the end of the discal cell. So what would you say about those, those spots from where you're sitting? Well, they're bolder on the desert. Yep. Actually, um, in terms of like length of the forewing, they're thicker. Okay. <laughs> you may, measured from uh, the base, you know, from ah. yeah. it's a conspiracy to make me exercise. From here to here, and, and that's the unit of measurement. And you know, I, I, by the time we got done doing that. So that's, that's the, the, the basic, um, and it's actually pretty good. You have to have an eye for it, but what happens is once you have a specimen that you're looking at, and once you recognize uh, that feature, then all of a sudden it actually plays into, um, you know, being able to identify that on a regular basis. Uh, there are other features, too, that we would, uh, you know, I didn't want to spend too much time on any one of these species. If you looked at the ventral hind wing, uh, the, the marbling is different, you know, there's one that has more yellow, body blah, 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 this, and there's all those things, too, but um, just wanted to, 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 you know, visit some of the, the features. Now, these are a male and female of the same species, and there's no question about, you know, what the difference is. What is the difference? Yeah, one is seriously uh, yellow, right? And and so that's uh, obviously one of the things that you include, you know, in your field marks. Okay, and um, I actually think that elephants are pretty easy to tell apart. All right, but a lot of people, you know, it's like as the scale of the creature goes down, the ability to discriminate them uh, becomes inhibited. So. I would say that, you know, even though I, I believe that they're all pretty easy to identify, uh, there are some things that you'd want to do, uh, you know, to make sure that everyone has a, 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 a good shot at it, okay? Um, this is the brown elephant, and uh, it's basically kind of like nondescript, and that's almost the way you describe it. If you see a little brown nondescript butterfly flying around in the spring, it's pretty much likely to be a brown elephant. And then this is Moss's elephant. And the thing about it is that if you look at, at Moss's elephant, there's a striking contrast between the basal area and, and the limbal area, okay? If you remember that, that chart. You know, when we do the field guide, we'll have that chart as an insert you can deal with, you know, so that you know limbal, basal, dorsal, ventral, cephalic, caudal, uh, post-marginal, and what I just did. So the, the same, the same line is on the brown elephant. It's just that you can't see the contrast because the contrast isn't there. See, the, the same line is, is there, right? So you have to be able to describe that line, and you have to be able to use it as a reference for um, making sure that someone who's trying to identify elephants has that, and they can say, aha, okay, so, you know, exterior to that line, you know, they're going to be uh, colored. Brown elephants is basically kind of a round orange color, and you know, uh, mosses elephants are basically more of a frosted color, okay? And then you've got the, the hoary elephant, the polyops, and same thing, the same line. And there you, you have, um, you know, almost bluish uh, appearance. This, there's no blue there at all, but it, it kind of looks like a uh, uh, blue color. But again, between the, the three images that we've looked at, um, you have to make those discriminations. The line is here in this butterfly, but this butterfly, 
is one where you really only need to show a picture. You wouldn't have to do it twice because it's a, in a pretty obvious um, you know, butterfly. It's not a, a, a butterfly you're going to you know, mistake. Once you show a picture of it, if you've got one in your hand or you see one perched on a pine tree, you'll know what it is, right? And that's a pine elephant. You know? All right. Now, oh, I thought we were done with the sulfur sign. I'm sorry. This is about as radically different as, 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 um, as a sulfur ventral can be. On the one side, you've got um, a um, orange sulfur, uh, um, and on the left, no, the left side, you got orange sulfur. On the right side, you've got Alexander sulfur from Colorado. So uh, what you're looking at is a series of spots on the forewing and on the hindwing. Uh, we call those urethemy spots uh, because that's the scientific name of the orange sulfur. Um, and they actually exist all around the world, so you know, calling them urethemy spots is very provincial. And, and I apologize for that, but you know, nobody here but me and you know about it, so <laughs> um, Then you have um, the uh, discal spot, okay, which is at the end of the discal cell on the ventral axis. We call that the ventral hind wing discal spot. A very interesting structure in the orange sulfur in that it has a very distinctive satellite spot. It's, um, you know, it's like a, you're looking at a picture of the Earth and the Moon from uh, two million miles away, and the Moon is rising behind the Earth, and, and you're, um, you've got your binoculars fuzzed up. You know, it's like that's it's like a satellite. You know, and it's double ringed. Okay, so you've got a ring of, of uh, red. It's right around the pearly portion of, of the spot, and then you've got uh, some sort of <coughs> pinkish scaling, and then another uh, ring outside of that, which defines the whole spot. So it's it's a, a composite spot, whereas in the Alexandra, yeah, you'd be hard pressed to see a ring at all. Okay, that's almost like you could say ventral, hind wing, discal spot, absent or pearly without a ring. Okay. So the dorsally, you know, we have the, the, the contrast that we talked about before. I mean, if, if we had a butterfly um, in the state, two butterflies in the state that consistently looked like this. We'd never have a problem telling them apart because they're about as different as you can get. Oops, I missed up. Ah, yeah. Now these are uh, the various kinds of, of uh, shenanigans that a ventral hind wing distal spots go through. You know, we just looked at uh, the uh, the very profound example in the previous slide. And it's also represented. I'm surprised I didn't hurt myself. I did that one time, you know, using my foot, because this is why, I, and I whacked myself. <laughs> right where it hurt. And then you go through all these uh, ramifications. You've got a really well developed a satellite spot, then you got one that's like, eh, not really. I mean, I had to cut these off with bigger images so they're kind of, uh, you know, fuzzy. But I wanted to show, you know, just the kinds of, of vagaries. And all of these vagaries actually occur in our state, so you'd have to actually define these in some sort of a way. Um, the one over there on the bottom left is Polius occidentalis, and that's pretty typical of an occidentalis. It's kind of like, it's vaguely smeared red. It's almost always like that. It's never really got, you know, uh, a satellite spot, never really has anything, you know, more than just that. And, and then if you get up into the Okanagan County and you're getting the Christina Sulphur, um, that spot in the middle at the bottom is, is often you know, what you're going to see. And then, of course, the Alexander, which we get sometimes in the, uh, in the, in the Columbia uh, Basin. Well, up there on the, on the uh, uppermost left, that's the nasty sulfur. And, you know, that's a nice spot because there's really nothing like that in the northwest except on, on, on the uh, uh, Labrador sulfur, the greenish sulfur, the nasty sulfur, Polius nasties. So, it, but, Honestly, if you actually uh, get a coleus nasties, you'll know what it is long before you get a chance to look at the spot. You know, you're going to be at 8,000 feet, and there's going to be a little green nasty thing. You know what it is when it's flying along. So um, we just do it to be official. Oh yeah. What's the best way to tell coleus occidentalis from coleus interior? Ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. That's why I totally avoid it. I'm not going to do that. I can't do that. I mean, even now I can't do it. You know, I sat down and actually said, well, can I do it? 
And I wrote down a bunch of stuff, and there's like so many exceptions. It's like, you know, you got two and a half pages discriminating the two. If or when and sometimes, you know, it's like, you know, it's it's really it's pretty hard. Um, and if you got somebody like me around, it's easy. Just ask Pelham, right? You can do it pretty much. All oh yeah. Time. Because I'm, I'm obviously brilliant, right? Yeah. I'm glad you asked. So, the, the hysteria skippers are a challenge for everybody. They're actually um, not so hard once you get to know them a little bit. And the thing is that uh, this is what you normally see of a, of a hysteria skipper, right? Um, what do they call rampant skippers, right? Is it land at mud or something like that? And normally, though, you're not even going to get this close to one. So uh, it's going to be hard. Most of the time, you'll see one in a jar that somebody caught, um, or you're going to be looking at them through binoculars, and they're going to be a lot smaller than that. Uh, it, it's, they're tough. They're, they're tough unless you actually you know, can see the dorsal surface. The dorsal is going to give them away. But man, this is a spot man. You know, every Hesperia skipper has a ventral hind wing that's basically broken into two components, the anterior and the posterior component. And, and the posterior component, you notice the last spot there is, is kind of offset, basically. Okay? Well, that's also characteristic of the Nevada skipper. But the Nevada skipper, you'll notice, has you know, like this um, dark uh, margin around the spots, right? And, and kind of a hoary aspect to the color. So if you go back and forth between the two things, you can see that they're actually pretty similar. But if you look at the, the, the key features, um, you can start to you know, pick them out. Now, if you see the dorsals, they're pieces piece of cake. So like in a, in a museum, when you got them spread in a, in a box, it's not a question. The, you know, the Nevadas are tawny on the upper side, and the Jubas are, have big black margins. It's, it's really not at all a problem. Now you get to um, the Idaho, uh, the uh, Western Brandon Skipper. You know, the other is the Juba Brandon Skipper and the Nevada Brandon Skipper. These can look like just about anything. In fact, I'm just going you know, to run through some things that they can look like, right? So between all of these here, that's a lot of, yeah. There's always been some confusion on which basal spot you're talking about. Can you point that out? Which one? Which spot you're talking about. Oh, OK. All right, we'll go back. See the lower, the, the posterior element of the spot band. It's, it's displaced this uh, basally in both Yuba and Nevada. Always in Nevada, mostly in, in Yuba. Okay? okay? Nevada, Yuba. Nevada, Yuba. But you'll, you'll also notice that you see that the Nevadas have kind of a, a different aspect of the green. It's, uh, it's kind of hoary uh, color. And it's got black margins. Uh, it's tough. It's going to be tough. But again, see, when I do the field guide thing, um, you know, we're going to be using all, the, all of the characteristics, even if you can't see them. So um, if you happen to be good enough to, well, first of all, get this close to a Nevada skipper. <laughs> and, and you um, also are, you know, maybe close enough to see it open its wings when it's hot nectar or something like that. Then you can definitely make an identification. But uh, these, when it comes to the Western branded skippers, they're so variable that, that that's going to be a real problem. These are all belong to, to, to basically one, one species, right? And, and so that's, that's going to be hard. You know, again, that, it looks like uh, we've got to use images, we're going to have to use descriptive text, and and a lot of times, you know, it helps to know where, where you're at. Like, you, you're not going to get something that looks like this out in the middle of the Columbia Basin, right? And, uh, and you're not going to get something that looks like that on top of uh, you know, Slate Peak. So, you know, those kinds of things do help. And even though, you know, those aren't, strictly speaking, taxonomic characters, if you try to write a scientific paper <coughs> using localities as, as, as criteria for identification, it, it, it wouldn't fly. The editor would say, well, no, those aren't taxonomic characters. But, for people in, in identifying uh, butterflies, yeah, that works just fine. Okay, now this is the uh, another one that's not a real problem in, in this state because uh, these are two different subspecies. One, this is a cedar feeder, and this is the juniper feeder of the, of the juniper or the, the cedar hair streaks. And, and you know, like really 
they're pretty similar to butterflies and they're pretty uh, distinct, okay? But that's also a, a juniper hair snake, and that's one from like um, Idaho. And we could get something that looks like that, a little green in it, and that would be, you know, a problem. So like that's one of the things that, um, that I was talking with Bob as he was doing um, his, his uh, Cascadia work. He's, you know, actually more peripheral. He's been talking about Washington, Oregon, a little bit of Idaho, and getting into a, a peripheral areas. He had to actually uh, deal with these kinds of butterflies. So sometimes we will. Now, there's another um, uh, issue that we're going to talk about um, all the time on field trips is metallic scaling, okay? These are uh, two butterflies that are actually very uh, similar. I would, I, I'm not even sure that I could, you know, tell you how, it, you know, how they differ. There, there's not really solid criteria, I guess, uh, the genitalia you know, play a role, but um, more, I'm, I'm showing this, Melissa on the left and, and Idis the mountain on, on, the, on the right. Now, mountain blue, is that right? Northern. Northern blue. Which one's a mountain blue? Yeah. Uh, the that's, that's not a standard name. The, the other one is. Uh, well, I'm not a standard fellow either, you know. <laughs> so uh, the most important thing here is to recognize the uh, the metallic, uh, because people are going to talk about that all the time. Nabokov called them the scintilli, and I love that word because there's a song that goes with it. Scintilli, they sent me. No. You don't think so? I'll have to Google that. Um, John, what, so what, how, can you go back to that last one? So if I'm looking at those two in the field, I, in the field I can tell the difference in a Melissa and a Northern, but looking at those two pictures. Well, I don't know. So where, you, where have you seen a Northern blue? Northern blue, um, up in Okanagan, and oh. then, yeah, that was, that's where I've seen At Moses Meadows. And also down in Enterprise. In Oregon, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Well, well actually, you're, you're right. Um, this is, this, this is, it can be tough. Um, let's put it this way. Um, Ernst Dornfeld, when he did the Butterflies of Oregon, uh, got them all wrong because he had, he had figured it out. It took us a while figured out. Um, it really, uh, no excuse for it, because John Shepard in 1964 wrote uh, the penultimate paper on that, uh, past Stavikov, that is, and he uh, actually identified all these things. It, was, it just took a long time for people to, to catch on, and, and, and the, they're, they're variable. And the other thing that's important to remember is that these butterflies actually hybridize to some degree. So uh, northern blues, like from uh, you know, Okanagan, are, are from uh, British Columbia. Uh, really are different. The ones that you get, you know, closer to the range of, of Melissa will actually, you know, converge on that pattern a little bit. I, I, I have to, I have to sympathize with people trying to discriminate. The females are radically different uh, on the dorsal side, but the ventral surfaces are actually rather, um, rather similar. But the, 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 the huh? Yeah, that would be helpful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, those are all things that are going to have to be done. Um, as part of creating this guide. And you can see, um, I'm going to be coming back to you all from time to time. I'm going to put, you know, different uh, combinations of words together and, and then ask you all if uh, you can improve upon it. Are you coming back, bro? Am I coming back? No, the, the, no, right. no, right. Well, I didn't know what you, yeah, I can't hardly really tell what you're doing anyway, so. John, huh? on the uh, Northern Melissa, there's a a color difference and a width difference in those uh, orange bands. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. But it, it, it's only, it's only uh, partially accurate rendition. Yeah. That's, that's the problem. And the exceptions, you know, that's the problem. If you have something that only works at 60%, it's almost not worth talking about because, you know, that's 40% that you're going to be wrong with. I mean, if I do 85%, I'm feeling pretty good. That's a probabilistically reasonable. Uh, expectation that you're going to be able to identify things. And then, you know, the collective, I mean, there's more things than just these images, too, that would help. Uh, obviously, uh, as we, you know, construct these uh, field guides, we're, we're going to have feedback on them, and, 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 and it will be using other characters so that you can, uh, you know, make a, a better judgment on the matter. But this is a, a, an example that we run into all the time, is, uh, you know, this is a, a buckwheat blue on the right and a, a lupin blue on the left. And they're the, the very similar, actually. Uh, if you actually just look at them on a flower, 
you might not you know, recognize how different they really are, but you can see that the lumen blue has scintillant spots. And I mean, these are small butterflies, and you can see those spots are big. So you're looking at you know, small markings on a small butterfly. It's sometimes pretty hard um, you know, to grasp um, or to see. So you, you really do have to look for them. And, and I think, um, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, like uh, the, the uh, observation uh, uh, canisters that people carry with them in the field uh, would be augmented by, you know, a, a, a hand lens so it would be a bad idea too, you know, so that you can, you know. Uh, but me, I don't have a problem because I catch them and I put them in death chambers. <laughs> so like, I know what I'm getting, you know, but that's not my job. I got, I got to get it so that you guys can figure it out. And, and this is an example of, of, a, of a loop and blue sitting on. I mean, it's not like the scintilli are, are uh, really, really obvious, but they're where they're supposed to be. So if you're looking uh, where you're supposed to be looking, you will see them, right? Okay, so what's happening? Oh, yeah. Now, this is a uh, yeah, buckwheat blue, right? So we're looking at um, kind of like what you'd be seeing in the field, right? What's it on? Huh? What's it on? Oh, it looks like a, oh, that's a noble lot. It's a glaucon from Oregon. I just picked it because it was a nice image. Yeah, you, you would notice that, wouldn't you? You know? I had to talk to you before I give these presentations. Like, if you see something, Dave, don't say anything. <laughs> All right. Now, Colophrics, green hair streaks. I call them elephants, All right. You know why? Okay, this is a diversion. All right. We all know what hair streaks are, and we all know why we call hair streaks, right? Because they have little tiny hair streaks. And, and we know why elephants are called elephants. No, we don't. They're, <laughs> somebody just called them elephants. But they were elephants because somebody called them elephants. Well, if you look at it, what does that look like? Does that look like a hair streak? No, it's a green elephant. See, I'm arbitrary. I mean, just I'm tired of orange sulfurs. You know, I'm tired of things that don't make sense. I want to start the revolution, and we got the body right here to do it, all right? So, from now on, oh well. <laughs> They're green elephants, come on, guys. They're hard. The best way to, to discriminate green hair streak elephants is to, to watch them when they're alive. Now, I can go into a collection, I can pretty much figure it out. Um, this is a butterfly, this is a, a male on the, on the left side there. We don't, in Washington, usually see males that are that orange, that yellow, or I mean tawny. Um, but it, it helps in, in other places um, discriminate them from um, the other um, green elephants because none of the others are as tawny as that, all right? Ours end up looking more like that, which as you'll see, um, well, be very confusing when compared to others. It's hard. Now, I showed you two images of, of these butterflies that are immaculate. It's like they really kind of live up to one of their names um, is immaculate, right? But trust me, none of those things really work out very well. If somebody says, you know, immaculate green hair streak, you can almost be guaranteed that it's not, that there's, you know, got spots and whatnot. But um, that's another thing. So we're going to go to Sheridan's, okay? Now, that is pretty typical Sheridan's hair streak elephant. You know, you go to Schnebley, you're going to see something that looks, you know, kind of like that, you know? And they, they go all the way. I mean, like the, the, the idea that you got, you know, these really nice white stripes, and then you, I mean, one day in Schnebley, you'll get both of these types of appearances. So you can see that if you're going to make, um, you're going to make a, a, a field mark, you know, create a field mark for these things, you're going to have to be creative and, you know, inclusive. Um, and that's a challenge, too. Um, you think that there would be something in these other little curly cues and all the different, you know, fringe colors and stuff like that, but they, they're not. None of those things really work out too much. And so then we got the bramble being here, Street. And I'm going to uh, run through this and see if you guys can tell me what the major difference between that is. John? Yeah. Is there any significance to the difference in the antennae? Um, there might be actually. I think that um, the, the the previous the, slide of this one, the antennae appeared to be radically different in length 
Oh, well, I don't, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, this but one there, the club is different. Those are the same. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think anybody's looked at that anyway. So I'm going to run through all the, this, this is the first one. Yes, this uh, immaculate green, right? Another immaculate green. We got Sharon's, Sharon's Bramble. Can anybody tell me? Brown. Yeah. This right, right here in the in the four wing and the the discal uh, sub discal portion, the portion below the discal cell is brown. Right. The others are either you know got green or they're gray. And green actually extends much further into the, the disc, and this turns out to be a fairly decent uh, character. Aside from the fact that they mostly occur in western Washington or western Oregon, um, where the others don't. That, you know, sort of that's the question on this, uh, the line is turned into a row of spots instead of a line. Is that diagnostic? No, that happens all the time with these. Okay. That's, it's really disconcerting. I mean, if you were in Colorado, uh, you have consistencies. Uh, it's, as you get into Washington and Oregon, you get the you know the things that are a fairly solid line occurring right alongside the things that are you know separate dots or almost immaculate. Now, um, one thing about the bramble, which is fairly consistent, is that it's the, the it's not a usual series of spots. It's usually one or two spots, and usually, as you can see in this case, uh, two similar spots in the same location. But even that's not real reliable. It's like you know one of those sixty percent of deals, right? So, and here's where we're going to get into some interesting things, and this is really hard. Um, this is um, Pacuvius dusky wing, right? Now, what I want to do is, is look at this portion of the wing right there. See that orange scale patch? Um, oops. That is very characteristic for this butterfly, and it's really hard to describe. Um, it's at the end of the distal cell. Um, it is a, uh, a a tawny patch, and it's like I hate saying like tawny patch because that sounds so indefinite, and it is. But we're we're trying to find it's it's so useful as a character that uh, you know that it, it, it's one of those that you're gonna you know want to uh, repeat. You want people to know and see because once you do see it, it's like it it, it stands out and it really does. Um, you guys see what I'm talking about, that tawny patch there? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and then polygonals. Now, I, didn't, I wanted to do this. I said, nah, I'm not going to have enough time. But and we have um, four species of angle wings. And all of them are, are, are actually fairly distinguishable. And, and Melanie and I had, you know, we had a tete a tete on this. She had some great images from up the research. And, and we were looking at a lot of them. Uh, was at least two species present, like was on scat or something, on poop or something? Yes, yeah. probably. I had a lot of them. Yeah. It was hard to tell what they were actually going into the ground. I couldn't tell if it was minerals, but some were on right. scat also. Okay. So the, the, the features that are, are, are most important um, include like all these green spots on the ventral hind wing. You see something like those green spots um, that you know, they become important. For all the species, okay? See, they're not at all on this, the Saturn angle wing. And um, barely, you see there's little, yeah, you see there's kind of yellowish orange or yellowish spots that are kind of there, but you know, certainly not in, in the, uh, the, what is it, Aureus? Aureus. Yeah, Aureus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're not there at all. So, you know, basically, if you're, you're seeing those, man, it's like a dead. You don't have to go very much further than that. It's a fawn. But if you wanted to and wanted to have you know features, and we will of course in a, in a field march, so I'll be making note of the uh, bands that are on the uh, dorsal hind wing. Uh, that marginal band, or if you wanted to, you know, to say a marginal band with submarginal spots within it, um, that is almost a classic character as well. And if you look at um, the Saturn's angle wing. Um, you have that same band present, but the marginals or the submarginal spots within it are expanded to the extent that it almost wipes wipes it out. And uh, certainly, by the time you get to the uh, is it the hori, yes. yeah. hori hori angle wing, um, they've expanded so that the, the band is almost not present at all. The almost the only way you can um, the, you know, talk about the band is in terms of the spots that have eaten it up, right? Um, then you get back um, to, to the Aureus, 
and you can see that that band is present again, but it's again not like the font. So, like there are these characters that we're going to be looking at. Okay, we'll go back. Look at the um, the question mark. Okay, the comma, the comma on the ventral hindwing. If you look at that, um, I, I should have blown it up. I should have asked some more, but you know, I was pressed for time. Uh, the there are hooks. There's hooks on the end of that. It actually is expanded at the tips, um, and that's. Um, not unique, but it's only shared by the sad, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I, that is, is a very useful um, feature. And then the other thing uh, with, with angle wings is color. Um, I, would, I would almost call this color, um, people say brown, grayish brown. I almost say there's a purplish aspect to it. Anybody else see that purplish color? Mm -hmm. All right, there we go. I feel better about myself already. Looks like I really needed that, huh? Um, that color is also very distinctive. There's no other, um, no other angle wing in western United States that approaches that, that brown color. It can be yellow, more yellowish brown. It can be much darker than that. It can be uh, better marked. I think we might even have um, an example that's better marked. No, we don't. So that's pretty characteristic too. So we're going through a slew of characters that actually help you out. Now that, um, uh, comma is basically um, no, it's just barely there. It's just like official, you know, there's no, just just a, an angle and it's uh, hardly noticeable at all. Same same with the uh, the aureus, but I mean, you know, when you when you talk about the aureus uh, angle wing, you're wasting your time if you're talking about anything except it's black. You know, this is a, it's, a black, base it's black here, but it's not like Northeast Oregon, it's not black. You from Northeast Oregon? Okay. Yeah, making trouble. Okay, yeah, it's black here. Um, this is here. This is like Northeast Oregon. Um, and it's and, and, and so like, you're right. But it's still darker than anything else. Okay. Right. Northeast Oregon. All right. So now I think we're coming uh, to the end of. of uh, what I wanted to do. Uh, we're talking about uh, details um, of, of, of color and, and pattern. Uh, this is basically two species, and you can see how similar they are in terms of overall construct. Uh, the basic difference between the two of them, and it's moderately reliable actually, is um, the spot that's just at the base of this um, blue patch, okay? Um, you have, in the one case, uh, a crescent-shaped spot on the left side, that's um, um, California Hair Street, and uh, the Silver Hair Street is on, on the right. It's a bar-shaped spot. You can also notice that the extent of the orange is very limited. Um, California, uh, uh, the California Hair Street can have those spots um, extend all the way up uh, the outer margin of the wing. <clears throat> they can also, uh, as you'll notice, be conjoined. You see the cap on the uh, blue, or the hoary patch. It's not blue scales there at all. It looks blue, but it's just white. With, with black over the top of it. Um, in, in California, that uh, the, the, uh, anal, the spot at the anal margin actually is conjoined with the cap over the blue spot, which is not so in silver hair streak at all. And so, you know, these, uh, these, this is the, the color. These are all both silver hair streaks. And of course, in this case, you know, you can see that the only markings on the one on the right are pretty much obscure. Well, that's almost a diagnostic character. I mean, if you get a hair streak that looks, you know, like you can say all spots uh, obsolescent, uh, then, you know, what you're talking about is a silver hair streak. So, and then, you know, the coloration, which is between these. Yeah, the coloration, you can see that even though the one on the right here is a silver hair streak, it's much more like a California hair streak, uh, whereas these are, are, are very divergent. Uh, we don't know but what this is actually ecological variation, so we're not sure. But, you know, if you're going to talk about it in a manual, in a, in a field guide, and you're going to look for field uh, marks, you have to be able to explain all of that, right? So um, that's what a California hair streak looks like on a rabbit brush, and that's what a silver hair streak looks like on a, a pearly everlasting. And you can see it actually pretty uh, similar, but if you look, that key character, which is the uh, crescent-shaped mark, um, you know, to the base of, of the blue patch. It's uh, bar-shaped in one and it's crescent in the other. 
All right, so now we um, are looking at another example of, can you guys tell what the, the food plant, or the nectar source is? Milkweed. Yeah, absolutely. They love milkweeds. In Kittitas Valley, when you go along, um, as you're coming down from um, Teresa Creek, you hit the main highway that's going up to uh, Blue and Pass, got all those willows along there, and those the milkweeds get to blooming. Those things will have hundreds of these hair streaks sitting on them. They're really something to see. All right, I told you we'd get to the good stuff. <laughs> now, I have to tell you here that there was a misprint I didn't notice until the end, but I kept it in there because it's great. They talk about all the parts, and they're actually labeled very well. Um, I, I don't like um, the, the name that they give to the male intromittent organ. I like saying that. <laughs> um, the male intromittent organ is a, a, you know, a penis. That sounds pretty ordinary, but it's very mammalian, too. Uh, I learned it as the E agus. E most technical texts would use that too. E agus, right? I like that a lot better. <laughs> Besides which, you can say that in public and people don't even know. <laughs> so, um, the, can you guys figure out the misprint? Associates? Anchus. Anchus, yeah. That's supposed to be anus. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you had uncus right above it, I could just see some grad students. Right. And this is the more interesting part, um, this is the female genitalia. Your females are absolutely, in case anyone of you have any doubt, females are the more important sex in every living thing that has sex. Is they, they reproduce, they, you know, they bear the children, they have the eggs, they do all that stuff. Males, as I said earlier, are just used to spags of sperm. Uh, that can occasionally in place of spragus. Okay, so just remember that, you know. If, if, if males out there, you think about, well, I might, have a is available, <laughs> necessary, but um, very convoluted, um, you know, uh, situation. There we got uh, the ovaries, of course, produce the eggs. Uh, everyone knows that. And uh, but this, this area right here, that's where the sperm is stored. And um, the the males actually are, are more than just used to spags of sperm. They're, Useless bags of sperm with a sperm donation that goes with it. They have a proteinaceous substance that they encapsulate uh, the sperm uh, with, and this is dissolved in the bursa and used as female nutrition. Okay, so the males are really giving their all. Um, there's people that have studied uh, how many times butterflies mate, and uh, they found some interesting things. Um, the females mate. Uh, maybe eight, two to three times, uh, or maybe more, but you know, two to three times is pretty, pretty much the average is 2.7 or something like that. And they always choose, you know, young, juicy males. Uh, males, on the other hand, once they've made it, uh, it's really it's hard going. It, it, they just, you know, they don't have the, the, the right stuff to get you know, second mating. And so, the male investment the first time around is big time, all right? Now, me, I prefer I, I prefer tetagonids, okay? And anybody here know what tetagonids are? Uh, of course, robins, right? They're, they're uh, orthox. They're, they're uh, like Katie is. And they sing. And the males sing. And the males sit high so that the females can hear them. And then they sing their song, and all the females come and they go, Oh, we love you, we love you. And the male says, mm, I don't have that one. Right? And it turns out that it's not nearly that romantic. Um, that male is making sure that their investment, which is really high, as much as 30% of body weight, uh, in the female, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a serious investment. So that you know, when they're seeing to the female and, and, and getting the females their choice of, for the next best chance for their offspring. So it's just you know, it's uh, it was kind of disappointing to actually hear that because I thought maybe you know my singing would amount to something, but I'm done. Man. Yeah. You got a question? <laughs> Come on, you don't have any questions. It's like, I have other questions, Jeff. Well, you don't count. You can get any time, right? He was my ride when I was laid up. He uh, took me to the doctor. And, and I learned about butterflies. I yeah, we talk about butterflies. And other yeah. Well, for some things like soils, they have color carbs that you can put there and well mm -hmm. this one doesn't fit, this one does and so on. Are those useful for butterflies? A lot of this seems so mixed with a whole bunch of stuff all 
I think that's the problem. I mean, you know, there's uh, uh, okay, uh, people that study moss. Hey, you won the scholarship, right? <laughs> Glad to see you. I'm sorry that, that you had to endure, you know, uh, all of the uh, prurient interest and stuff. I, I forgot we had a young person right in the first row. I hate being a, a bad influence, but. Like well, I have been my whole life. <laughs> Just to make trouble, Doug. Um, the thing, I keep thinking about all the colors and stuff. And you know, obviously, people in other areas of entomology have to deal with that. And Rod would know more about this than I would. But in Melville Hatch's tomes of beetles, he has millions or figuratively speaking, millions of names for colors and subtleties of colors he had to deal with. Um, but it probably be too much work to have to mine through his work to get all the colors. I don't know. Well, I think it's, uh, there's a good chance that it would be more confusing. Uh -huh. um, there's a good chance that if I went to the trouble of trying to describe all the individual colors that you're likely to encounter, you know, in any given one of the sulfurs, for example, um, that you're doing yourself uh, a disservice or the, the reader a disservice. What, what I try to do is find things that are uh, a little more concrete than a, than a color. Or if I'm describing the color, you know, do it in such a way as to make sure that the a person hearing my description is not going to feel too confident that it is one thing or another. Because most of the colors we're talking about are sort of a, a, uh, a panoply. Did I use that word right? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's names, like for instance, the green on the other side of the polygony. Yes. Right. Uh, uh, there's a name for that kind of green. I've yeah, but that's the difference between a poet and a scientist. You know, you would know that, right? There's a scientific word. I forget the word, but there's a name for that. It has to do with the color of oxidation on certain kinds of metal. I was going to say malachite or azurite. Well, as you're as you're right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the short the short version of everything I was going to say was there are names for those colors in the those weird combinations. Well, it sounds like you, you want to be a fundamental part of this operation, you know, like you can help me figure out all those colors, you know? You volunteer, bro? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. Any more questions? Yeah? So far as your field guy is going to be Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I didn't, you know, I, I wanted this to be interactive, but I knew at the end you know, I was going to do most of the talking. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you really want prurient yeah, interest, yeah, yeah. you should uh, forget about butterflies and katydids and talk about sex and sexy flies. Hmm. Uh, Sounds like you were uh, volunteering to give us a presentation. Uh, no, I, I mean, there, there, there's one paper, uh, uh, and I wouldn't make a whole presentation, but it provides evidence that the females, sexy flies, preferentially mate with males that will give them greater genital stimulation. Uh -huh. I, actually, I think you could make that a presentation. It might be kind of exotic and interesting. Could you do it in like 15 minutes? Get somebody to act out the roles of the fly. Alright, yeah? So you can put this all together and make it available for people. Well, this is another problem. Uh, you know, as uh, Caitlin has been able to do this with PDF files, and I, I suspect uh, that that's going to be uh, the likely way to go, at least just with the field guide portion of it. I mean, you know, as a field guide to, um, you know, the butterflies of Washington State, um, I honestly feel like, you know, if you include um, all, the, all the stuff that we know about a butterfly, then you make it a book, right? I'm not looking. I'm looking just to have those things that so you can carry it into the field. And I'm thinking probably under 30 pages, you know. Um, if you print it out from a PDF, right? Um, and I don't, I'm not sure. We might go another different way. caitlin has been experimenting with some different uh, ways to do things. I think uh, what's clear, and Bob Pyle told me this, and, and he, he made this decision a long time ago when he did Watching Washington Butterflies. You guys seen Watching Washington Butterflies? It's just big, right? It's just a little. And, and you know, Peterson had it nailed. It's like, if it's too big, Nobody's going to carry it into the field. It's not going to be useful. Um, if it's too big, even if it's small, it's too thick, it's not going to be useful either. So something that is like um, on the order of a small hand-sized thing that could go into your, uh, into your pocket or in a backpack easily, 
of how we get there from you know where we are, uh, that's going to be a matter because you have to you know have to work pretty hard to you know condense it down. But does that sound like a format you'd be interested in? No, definitely. You sent me some wonderful emails that oh. I shared with people. Oh dear. <laughs> Hope you don't mind. Did I use uh, the language properly? The language was well done. Okay. Well, it sounds like an awful lot of these, you go out and you catch one specimen and you can't be sure. And it seems to me your field guide legitimately could have a lot of weasel words in it. This yeah. is the most likely, but it could be a whole bunch of other stuff. No, I, uh, I like weasel. I think that uh, this is an appropriate way to use weaseling. Um, what, I, I, I've looked at a lot of people and their efforts to, uh, I mean, the things that I don't like is when you see a book, uh, and I don't want to pick on Glassberg because Oppler did it too. They have a line that points to this mark on a wing. It, that's almost never true. I mean, you know, when people say immaculate green hair streak, I know right away it's got spots, right? Um, if, if somebody says this is so, then I know there's always an exception. So uh, field marks are, 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 are like, I'd like to weasel for every field mark that, that I'm going to mention. But you're right, and you have to do it within a certain parameter. And, and there's going to be some things that you just can't do. I mean, checker spots are going to be really, really hard. Uh, if I manage uh, to do checker spots in the field, I will try. Uh, I will do it mostly on the basis of, like, if you're in the Columbia Basin, these are the butterflies and the checker spots you're likely to see. If you're at Slate Peak or in the North Cascades, these are the checker spots you're like, uh, like you see. In fact, uh, we had this uh, discussion with Regina. Um, she was getting all these, Regina Rochefort, is that how you say her last name? She was getting these images from like around Mount Rainier, <coughs> and she had images from um, like um, up North Cascades. Uh, check the spots that, you know, they, they look like the same thing, right? And, and I said, well, uh, well, and that's the way checker spots go. Um, we have done extensive sampling and done all the, the dissection, and we know that you know, in this year, checker spots don't get south of a certain point in the Cascades, and, and snowberry checker spots don't get north of a certain point in the Cascades. And knowing that, actually, um, you know, like it, it's kind of a, a weasel in, this, in, in a sense because Actually, it could. I mean, you might, you know, be. Uh, in fact, droppers is uh, always sticking his nose in a place where uh, we might see some things, you know, get a little bit further north or a little bit further south than, than we have thought. There's always things like that that happen. But for the most part, I mean, it's like um, probabilistically, if, if you're right 95% of the time, that's pretty good, right? And that 5% of the time, you look like an idiot, you know? And um, that's just the way things go. Right? Are we done? <laughs>